Welcome, welcome, welcome. Girl, you know I will be coming home. Welcome, welcome. This is your mental health hookup with Barbara Wilson. I'm your host, Jason Downs. And this is a special broadcast here at KHTS, your hometown station, because mental health is important to us, and we believe it is important to the well-being of our community. Today is May 16, and we are in the midst of Mental Health Awareness Month. So let's continue our mental health education today together. Our topic today is about how injuries, trauma, and post-traumatic stress are interconnected with and can affect your mental health. We have a very special guest on the show today who has firsthand experience dealing with mental health issues after a serious injury and has turned that knowledge into a nonprofit to help other folks dealing with similar issues. Uh, I'm so glad that you've joined us here on Mental Health Hookup. Here's to your good health and good health for all. Mental Health Hookup is a nonprofit and is dedi dedicated to providing clinical support to families affected by serious mental illness in the Santa Clarita Valley and beyond. Whatever mental health services you need, they can provide or they hook you up with someone who can. They should be your first and last stop for mental health in the Santa Clarita Valley. So if you, a member of your family, or anyone you know is suffering from mental illness, reach out and make an appointment today at mentalhealthhookup.org or by calling 661-799-7994 to speak to a live agent 24 hours a day. Once again, we're so fortunate to have Barbara Wilson of Mental Health Hookup with us today. She has a Master of Social Work uh, degree and has worked as a licensed clinical therapist in the state of California for the past 50 years. How are you? How are you today, Barbara? I am good. I am excited. We had a wonderful event over the weekend, but it was really hot. So it's nice to get out of the sun, um, but we're getting good feedback from our event, so... Excellent. I'm so glad. You had your, your first annual Stop the Stigma SCV event this weekend, so congratulations on that. I'm sure it will be the first of many. Uh, we may be having some technical difficulties here, I can't tell. Uh, anyhow, so we'll talk more about that in a little while. We have our, our special guest on the line with us today, Andrew Skinner. Andrew Skinner is the founder and CEO of Triumph, found, uh, the Triumph Foundation, and he has a very interesting story. Andrew, thank you so much for being here today. How are you? How are you? How are you feeling? <laughs> I'm I'm feeling great today. Thanks for having me, Jason and Barbara. I'm really excited to be part of the show. You got it. You got it. It's our it's our privilege. So. Tell us, tell us about Triumph. Uh, tell us uh, a little bit about your story and, and how Triumph Foundation came, came to be as a result. So my story begins with myself suffering a spinal cord injury. Um, I got hurt in 2004. I was uh, fresh out of college. Um, I had graduated with my um, degree in business and uh, was living out in Ventura, had met the girl of my dreams, had landed a great job, and I was on top of the world. And I went and joined my family up in the Lake Arrowhead area um, to celebrate Thanksgiving. And that week was um, a winter wonderland. And so it snowed like crazy, and we had spent our days goofing off out front of the cabin, um, having snowball fights and sledding. And I was out front snowboarding. Um, and uh, the day after Thanksgiving, November 26th of 2004, I was out front of the cabin just goofing off with my cousin. And I went off a little jump that we had built. And I fell. And it didn't look like a hard fall, but the landing apparently was because I broke my fourth, fifth, and sixth cervical vertebrae in my neck and was paralyzed instantly from the neck down. And my whole life uh, took a radical detour that I never saw coming. And I had no idea where to turn or where to go and, and was really uh, just feeling hopeless and in despair. Um, so before... Very fortunate... Sorry, go ahead. 
No, go, you go ahead, Jason. Well, before you get into the the Triumph Foundation, I just want to ask you a quick question there. So, I mean, you were you were nineteen, you said. Twenty four. Twenty four. Twenty four. Just just, college, just yeah. graduated college. So so as far as as your mental state and 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 the the journey that you had to take toward mental health, can you talk about some some of that? Because I know it plays a huge part in in how much you help. The, the, the folks you work with in, in the Triumph Foundation. So can you just give us a little bit of where you were coming from at that time? Yeah, I mean, as a 24-year-old young man, um, I thought I was invincible. Um, I had, think I broke my wrist when I was a little boy. But other than that, I was uh, pretty much um, injury-free. <laughs> had never really gone through any kind of um, severe, you know, um, uh, impairment or anything like that. And so... Uh, it was shattering. Uh, when I got hurt, you know, uh, the toll it took on my body, I wasn't able to move really anything from the neck down. Uh, I needed help to breathe. I needed help to um, uh, do everything, feed myself. Um, I was totally dependent on others. And so uh, it was uh, earth shaking where uh, I went from Mr. Independent and uh, to Mr. You know, dependent on every single thing, and it was really difficult, not just physically, uh, but the mental, emotional toll uh, was quite severe as well. So how, how in the world did you work through that? Can you, can you tell us how long it was between the accident and when you came up with the idea for Triumph, first of all? Yeah, so, uh, I mean... When I first got hurt, as you know, lying in the hospital bed, really not knowing what kind of future uh, my life could possibly have, and was it even worth living? And I went through all the different stages of uh, grieving, and um, you know, anger, sadness, um, remorse, um, just uh, frustration, and it took me a good time just to kind of. Um, come to terms with the fact that this was my new reality, that this wasn't a bad dream and I was going to wake up from. And so uh, my whole life's focus was put into my rehabilitation. And so for the first three months, I was at the hospital. Um, I did my rehab at Northridge Hospital, and they have an excellent spinal cord injury um, program there. And while I was there, I was not only uh, – you know, I had great physical and occupational therapists that were helping me, but I also had people that had gotten injured before me that came and visited me and kind of uh, gave me hope and showed me what life could be like. And I could never repay them um, for uh, that gift. And I really would have been lost without have met, you know, others that have kind of uh, lived through a similar experience. Sounds like they were kind of mental health coaches for you, but did you have actual, did you have mental psychotherapy? Yes. Did you have, you did? Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, that was part of the rehab program was, was working with a psychologist and having someone that not only I could talk to, uh, but my family could join me in some of those sessions too, and also receive some care and receive some, you know, um, coping mechanisms and, and just some help. And so that was part of it. And also they had a support group that ran every week. And so on my rehab schedule every day, I would have, you know, different um, times and I'd have to show up to, like I said, physical therapy or occupational therapy. And then once a week, it was to be part of the support group. And so at that support group is uh, ran by the psychologist and, um, you know, facilitated probably 20 or 30 you know, others that also had an injury like me. And, and some of them were, um, you know, acute, fresh injuries like me. And then um, probably the majority of them were all patient alumni that had gotten hurt um, some time back. And, and they were there not only for, you know, assistance, but they were also there to, um, you know, help the next person. And uh, that just really touched me in such a powerful way that I always felt kind of called to serve and to be that next, you know, um, person that would, um, just offer advice and, and support to others that, you know, sadly get hurt too, as I wasn't the first and I wasn't the last. And, and how important would you say that, that, that support, that mental support 
was to your recovery and then and then eventually creating the Triumph Foundation? Well, it's on a scale from 1 to 10, I would say it'd be like an 11 or 12 or more. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think that's probably one of the biggest pieces of advice I give when it comes to mental health is uh, don't bottle it up. Um, I, I worry more about people that don't shed a tear, people that, that try to pretend like you know nothing's happening, that nothing's changed. Um, those are the people that are most concerning to me and um, I know for me, it was difficult to sometimes um, man up, if you will, and share those kinds of feelings with others. Uh, but when I did, it was um, so relieving. Uh, and to talk to other people that also, um, like I said, had similar experiences. And, and one thing, and then we'll talk about Triumph in a minute, but uh, one thing that I, I just encourage everybody is, you know, just because I have a spinal cord injury doesn't make you know, my experience any more valid than any of others. Uh, everybody goes through life-changing challenges that seem insurmountable, and and being around other people and having fellowship, um, you know, it really makes a huge difference. And so, um, you know, being open um, and sharing your feelings is something that uh, I just encourage people that you are not alone, and you're not reinventing the wheel, and there's a lot of other people that have probably struggled with similar feelings. So before we specifically talk about Triumph, Barbara, do you have any any thoughts or, or questions for Andrew? I don't. Uh, Andrew, I'm just so happy to be on the same program as you. Uh, uh, it was wonderful meeting you uh, last week. And, you know, you just touch my heart when you talk. Um, and, and I've seen this happen with other people. I have a good friend actually whose beautiful son was also in his mid-20s and I think he went surfing or something and, and uh, snapped his back and he's uh, a quadriplegic. Um, he had everything going. He still has everything going but he has it going from a wheelchair. So that um, loss of anything triggers uh, depression. And mm -hmm. I am so glad to just hear you describe that at this hospital that where you were treated, they in, they folded in um, mental health treatment so that it wasn't unusual. It wasn't like something you had to make a separate decision about. They just said, well, here's the menu. You're going to have vegetables and meat and, and potatoes. And you just went, oh, okay. I guess that's what I'm eating is vegetables, meat, and potatoes. Um, so they didn't make it something unusual that's off to the side. And I think that is what's really uh, It was an integral part here, of the healing process. That they, they, the, t the treatment itself did not separate physical recovery from mental health recovery. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that's what we need to do more of. Um, the, the term that they use in the Affordable Care Act is integrated care, which is to integrate the physical care the mental health care, and if there's any addiction health care, it's all the same person. And then we need to treat, you hear people talk about whole person care. Mm. This is what we're talking about is everybody, every part of you gets to come into the room at the same time. So yay. And it sounds like, Andrew, you, you, you talked a little bit about that newly injured support, right? Mm -hmm. Um, visiting hospitals, providing hope and resources, is that, is that kind of the same thing? These peer mentors that you talked about, the support groups that you talked about, I mean, it, it, as Barbara's saying, this all sounds like just such integral parts, you know, big, big parts of the, of the pie. Um, do you want to say anything more about that? Is that something that you and your foundation provides as well, or is that just something that helped in your healing? Yeah, no, so we try to be holistic, and, and like you mentioned, uh, to integrate all the different aspects of, you know, my condition with the physical aspect, but also the mental and emotional. Um, you know, there's more than just trying to get your body moving again. It's also getting your life moving again and, and getting your mind kind of wrapped around the idea that, um, you know, I might need to make some adjustments in my life and uh, to be around other people that have kind of, um, experience similar feelings, experience similar, um, you know, life, um, changing circumstances and, um, you know, being around positive energy, I think is, is really important. Um, uh, it's always easy to, um, you know, think about what you can't do, but, um, 
sometimes we need to recognize all the things that we do are and are capable of, you know, accomplishing. And and one thing with you know my particular situation was, uh, thankfully, you know, this injury was very physical, but um, my mind and my heart and my spirit, from our strongest muscles, are still very much intact. Mm-hmm. And in a lot of ways, they come out stronger than ever. And so. Uh, when I started Triumph Foundation about four or five years after I had gotten injured, you know, my uh, goal was to just provide hope um, and resources to others that go through a similar circumstance because um, I know how much it meant to me and, um, you know, just being there for other people. You may not always have the right words, uh, may not know exactly what to say, but just to even just listen, I think takes a big difference. Um, and that's kind of the cornerstone of Triumph Foundation is is being those kind of first responders, if you will, of uh, going into hospital rooms and people's lives when they're suffering and providing that light and providing that hope and also, you know, providing some real tangible resources on where to turn. And for a lot of folks, it's um, you know, also receiving some uh, mental health care, seeing a psychologist, a psychiatrist, or or a counselor, somebody that can help you kind of work through some of the the challenges that you might be facing. Um, how important? Because- how important to, to the mental health and, and just the healing process that, that you're describing are the are the adaptive recreation activities that you are also very involved in. Yeah, so you know, Triumph Foundation, like I mentioned, you know, we're visiting you know hundreds of people each year in, in hospitals all throughout Southern California, and we provide them a care pack that has resources and and other kind of feel good items that will hopefully kind of brighten up their stay while they're in the hospital, but also um, to guide their way as they go beyond and, and kind of reintegrate back into the community. But our big fear is people will go and isolate themselves. Uh, I've seen too many people that. Um, go and hide from the world, and they want to go underneath the covers and say, la, 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 this isn't happening, and they miss out on so much. And so one of the things that Triumph has grown to do is not just the initial um, resource and peer mentor visits and and leading these support groups, but also getting people out in the community, being active. Um, And so one of the ways we do that is through our adaptive recreation programs, and so we're always hosting some sort of sport or activity um, that just gives people a chance to push the limits of their ability, which is good for their physical, you know, uh, health, um, but also just being around some other people um, that, you know, I think is really important for people's mental health um, to see what you're there, you know, how people just um, carry their head up uh, and, and aren't, you know, depressed all the time. And, you know, the scary thing about depression, I think, is, um, is it's human. Um, I feel like, you know, if you're a human being, you're going to go through days that just aren't always rainbows and sunshine. And it's okay to acknowledge that. And it's okay to allow yourself to to kind of feel sad sometimes, uh, but you just can't let yourself get stuck in a rut. And so one of our biggest pieces of advice to folks when we first interact with them is you need to get out of bed every day and you need to do something. Hmm. And we're big on goal setting. And so telling someone, you know, uh, at least get up out of bed. And then once you start doing that every day, now let's, you know, try to get out of the house. And whether it's to walk or roll around the block or to, you know, go to the mall or, or something that was really great for me was going to museums. It was a nice, quiet place that was air-conditioned, Barbara. <laughs> and uh, places that, you know, you can kind of find some peace and maybe get outside of your head Um because one of the things that we talk a lot about is uh, it's not just the paralysis of your physical, um, but also just your mental. A lot of people um, overthink things, and they just get confined to the four walls around them, and they're overthinking about, you know, what if this could happen? What if that could happen? And I don't know how I feel, and, and they get so bottled up, the paralysis of analysis if they don't get out there and just live. And I feel like one of the best paralysis of analysis. That's right. Yeah. All right. Look, we're going to, we're going to take a break, but we're, we're talking to Andrew Skinner of the triumph foundation. And it's, it's, it's always so great to talk to you, man. Um, look, you've got 
Before before we go, you've got a Let Them Roll gala coming up July 23rd. Do you need volunteers? Do you need what? What, what tell tell us real quick about that? You got got a few seconds. So Triumph is always doing events, and we want to invite the entire community to join us. We are all inclusive, meaning no matter who you are, what your ability is, you are welcome. And we do fun stuff. And so coming up this Friday, we're doing hand cycling at Balboa Park in Van Nuys. Uh, in a month, like you mentioned, we're doing our big gala. It's a let them roll casino night. And so it's lots of fun. Oh. And there's dancing and games and dinner. Oh. And we'd love to have anybody join us. Okay. Where so, and when? <laughs> yes, where, where and when? Saturday, and... Saturday, July 23rd. And we're going to be hosting it at the Universal Hilton this year. So down by you. Oh wow! Nice, Hilton. nice. Uh, and and what, uh, what? What's your website? Just so folks can go and visit and and see this information there as well. So if you just go to supporttriumph.org, um, that'll take you right to us. And you can also just Google Triumph Foundation, and we'll pop right up on the search results. And and if there's anybody out there that you know just needs to connect with good human beings. Uh, we'd invite you to join us. If there's certainly, if there's anybody out there dealing with a life-altering injury or a disability, uh, please don't be shy. Reach out to me. Reach out to Triumph. We, we want to embrace you and help you uh, find your way. Andrew Skinner, the Triumph Foundation. Thank you so much. You're listening to Mental Health Hookup here on KHTS 98.1 FM and AM 1220. Ah, summer trips to the beach, barbecues. Taking classes. Wait, did you say taking classes? Yeah. College of the Canyons has a great selection of summer classes starting in June and July. I'm traveling this summer and I don't want to take in-person classes. Both online and on-campus options are offered. Well, I don't have a lot of money to spend. COC is only $46 per unit. Wow, I never realized how beneficial taking a summer class at COC could be. Visit canyons.edu slash schedule and get ready, reset, go summer. Playing now at the Canyon Theater Guild are two literary classics that you won't want to miss. Little Women the Musical will delight you with show-stopping music and ballads fitting this timeless story of family and perseverance. Also, The Lilies of the Field, dedicated to the late Sidney Poitier who earned his first Oscar portraying the lead role in this delightful and heartwarming story. Both shows run through April 16th, so get your tickets now by calling the box office at 661-799-2702 or online at canyontheater.org. Time for a car wash, but fearful of the scratches that go along with it? Canyon Car Wash and Valencia Car Wash proudly use 100% lamb's cloth to prevent scratches and provide the best wash possible. Both locations use environmentally friendly solutions to wash and wax your vehicle, and they both accept all other car wash coupons. Give your vehicle the wash it deserves. Visit Canyon Car Wash on Soledad across from Edwards Cinema or Valencia Car Wash on Creekside Road behind Target. Santa Clarita has a new singing sensation, Terrell Edwards. Terrell Edwards opening at Santa Clarita's Canyon Club for the Super 70s group Ambrosia. That's Ambrosia and Terrell Edwards at the Canyon Club Santa Clarita, Saturday, June 18th. Ambrosia and Terrell Edwards. Reserve your tickets now at hometownstation.com forward slash Ambrosia. Hey, Ned, what's with the cape and tights again? Didn't the boss tell you about that? No. This time, I'm really a Pacific Air hero. I'm flying around keeping our customers cool with our Wow AC tune-up. It's Super Ned to the rescue. Get in the truck, Ned. Well, we're not letting Ned run around in tights. But we are saving people every day. Mark Schneider and daughter Kaylee for Pacific Air. We're saving people from a hot, miserable home caused by an aging or broken AC system. When you call Pacific Air, we know your time is precious. So we promise on-time service to save you time. And right now, with every WOW AC tune-up, we will disinfect and sanitize the inside of your heating and air system free. We think you'll say... When you want the best, call Pacific Air. Schedule your Wow AC tune-up now, just seventy-seven bucks, and we'll sanitize your heating and air system free. No surprises, just exceptional service because nobody cares like Pacific Air. Details at PacAir.com. Your hometown station, KHTS.
Mental Health Hookup with Barbara Wilson. I'm your host, Jason Downs. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you'd like to call in and speak to Barbara, we always welcome that. We have Andrew uh, with us today behind the booth, and he'll he'll screen your calls. But feel free, 661-298-5487, especially if you have experienced an injury or trauma, post-traumatic stress that has uh, led to some mental health issues for you. That is our topic today. We're talking about injuries as they relate to mental health and how they affect your mental health, uh, post-traumatic stress. And, and speaking of, Barbara had her first annual Stop the Stigma SCV event for Mental Health Awareness Month, which which uh, the month of May is our Mental Health Awareness Month. And uh, someone from the military spoke. Do you want to do you want to tell I, us a little bit about? We did. We had a uh, <clears throat> we had a program, even though it was kind of a fair format. And one of the speakers, can you hear me? One of the speakers was Lieutenant uh, retired Lieutenant um, Colonel Dave Jackson. He was gracious enough to get out in public on the stage and share his experience of being in the military, and how not only did that affect him, but also affected his family. Um, and many times when we think of mental illness, we automatically think of, oh, they're very scary, let's kill them now. And then we move from there to, oh, they must be using drugs, and so that's why they're that way. Um, but when we actually get to the person, then we go, oh, that person really needs help. So rarely do we talk about or even notice that that person has a family, maybe a wife, maybe children, siblings. Um, and he made the point that all of the family is also affected. Um, they were all affected because of the struggles that he had that he did not recognize he was having. Because isn't that just the way? I'm fine, don't you know? What's your problem? Um, well, the, so I mean, the awareness. The awareness. Has, has since then, I mean, are we talking about Vietnam War? Veteran, no, this, or? this was, uh, I think he said he was in Afghanistan. Okay. So uh -huh. He's a fairly youngster. Younger. You know, to me. Yes. <laughs> you know, I'm from the Vietnam era. Uh, and so there was a lady there uh, who I know. I, I didn't know she had any issues in her family at all. She later came up to me and she said, I just want to thank you for putting this together. And I'm like, oh. No, uh, thank you for ha coming, you know, and I was like, I, I thought that was it. And she said, no, really. I've been having trouble with my son ever since he came back from when he was deployed. Hmm. And I just didn't know what to do, what to say, what to not say. It seems like I upset him. So it was really very helpful for me to be able to talk to Dave and have him just kind of walk me through the process what I ought to look out for, and how I ought to keep my mouth shut and just let him be until he figures some things out. Anyway, uh, they had a real conversation that she just felt eternally grateful for, and she said, I hope you do this again next year. So uh, that was very gratifying. So interesting. I, I, I'm sure there's such a, a jump in awareness between someone from the Vietnam era, who experienced that war, as opposed to Desert Storm or Afghanistan, uh, can ha have you observed any of of that in your practice? Because, I mean, look, <laughs> right? If we if we had more awareness during post Vietnam, right, for for all these boys coming back with this post traumatic stress, right, from their injuries, like Andrew, or from you know just seeing the horrors, et cetera, et cetera how different would the, the landscape be today? And then there's the whole thing about watching war from your television over dinner. Mm. And what, you know, now mm. we're starting to hear terms like secondary trauma, um, a vicarious trauma, which we didn't used to talk like that. I mean, I can remember, I was in college during the Vietnam War, and we used to watch the war while, while while we were eating dinner at 5 o'clock, we would watch Walter Cronkite or whoever was on. Mm -hmm. 
And there is a certain amount of vicarious, oh my God, going on while you're sitting in the comfort of your own home, sure. safe and sound, watching somebody get blown up or their children are getting blown up, or the horrific stuff of war. Uh, that goes on. So are you saying that secondary trauma is similar to secondary smoke and that it, it, it can potentially affect? It does. I, I, I don't know. I'm not a public health person, so I can't compare it to like secondary smoke. <laughs> but what I can say is that we now know uh, that, for example, first line responders, pol law enforcement, fire department, um, Psychiatric social workers, you know, mental health workers, people that are the first line of defense when something is happening. Um, the officers that come upon a, a terrible accident on I-5 and they see guts everywhere and blood, brains everywhere, they are impacted. Now, what do they do with that? That's the issue. And that's becoming an issue to the point that the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors, to their credit, passed a, a motion, I think a, a year or two ago, saying that first line responders in certain departments, fire, you know, EMTs, that sort of thing, law enforcement, that they would be um, able to be fast-tracked into mental health counseling. Mm -hmm. Because you know there's stigma there too. Sure. If you're in law enforcement, sure. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm all, I'm so fine. But there, I see a lot of the families in law but enforcement. But you're talking about even just, just witnessing, just witnessing this, this trauma, yes. not, not even being the not one to experience it yes. firsthand. It, yes. And I, I think that's, that might be huge. Maybe we should talk about that next time as well, because I feel like we could, I mean, look, we're, We've all been through the pandemic. Now we're, you know, witnessing a war uh, witnessing uh, all a over war. again on, on are, TV. Somebody called attention to it at our event that we, I think the most popular speaker, we had a wonderful young woman who spoke about her lived experience. She just finished college successfully. But the single most popular guy that had people lined up to talk to him, much to my surprise, was Lieutenant Brandon Barclay, who was the watch commander of uh, L.A. Sheriff's Department, you know, and he was just so kind and so gracious because Lord knows he is, like, you know, impacted every minute of every day he has to plan out. Uh, but he stayed, and everyone who wanted to talk to him, he was just very kind. And he talked about these new things that are coming. Some things have already been implemented that's going to make it more user-friendly for families that are here in Santa Clarita that have a crisis in their family with a family member with mental illness. That has hmm. been something that has been a struggle. And sometimes there have been some really bad outcomes. And so now we have funding because that's what it takes it's not like you know mental health people don't know what to do but you have to pay them um, we have now reinstituted something we used to do back in the 70s where you had a mental health professional ride along with a law enforcement officer so the law yes. enforcement officer doesn't have to do the assessment yes. the law enforcement officer is there for backup we know that works. So that has already been rolled out. He talked about that. But also he talked about there is coming a new three-digit emergency number specifically for mental health. And it's going to be 988. I'm putting it out here now. Uh, it's going to be nationwide. And um, hmm. we think this is going to be a game changer so that it will free the real 99, you know, somebody bleeding from someone who's ha in a mental health crisis. That's that's so good to hear. That's that's great so. news. I, I actually I spoke to a, a law enforcement officer ab about that, and he had a similar idea. That I, I guess it sounds like you've already you've already done and has already been in practice in the past. But this notion that you are taking along someone who can assess whether or not, oh, this is someone who needs to go to drug treatment, not jail. Oh, this is someone who needs to go to a mental health facility, not j you know, this sort of thing. And the officer is just there as backup. Right. I love that notion. Right. And, that and then they don't, that way they know not to come with their guns drawn and, you know, 
set you know set up all that paranoia of sure it hostage sets, yeah. taking and all of that you know so it doesn't it's, make it's, anyone uh, feel at ease <laughs> and it's hugely expensive in terms of we I think need to remember just how valuable law enforcement time is yes they when we call and their job them, is already difficult enough they are already on a difficult job but then when they get a mental health call it is a huge time sucker for them they have requirements that they have to fulfill before they can walk away from that person well and like you said we need them to do their job yes. and let, and and and, the, the and one that thing i used to agree with uh what's his name Lee Baca, he and I were on a program together some years ago, and uh, I said to, to the audience, this is the one thing that for sure I agree with Sheriff Baca about law enforcement should not be assessing people. That's not their training. Just like I don't want to take people down in a chokehold sure, because right. I'm a social worker. Mm. I don't know how to do martial arts, and I'm not trying to learn. <laughs> So we need to each do stay in our own lane and work collaboratively. And when we do that, we serve the we serve the public. We're talking to Barbara Wilson, licensed clinical social worker here on Mental Health Hookup. Mental Health Hookup is a nonprofit and is dedicated to providing clinical support to families affected by serious mental illness. So if you or anyone you know is suffering from mental illness, reach out and make an appointment today at mentalhealthhookup.org or by calling 661 799-7994 to speak to a live agent 24 hours a day. So stick with us. We're talking about injuries and how they affect mental health and, and, and trauma and post-traumatic stress. So if you have experienced any of these sorts of things and would like to talk to Barbara today, feel free to call in 661-298-5487. We'll be right back here on KHTS 98.1 FM and AM 1220. This is Bradley from Santa Clarita Grocery, the all-volunteer grocery program serving children, families, and individuals experiencing food insecurities. Since January 2020, Santa Clarita Grocery has distributed 83 tons of fresh groceries to 4,465 families in the SCV. Santa Clarita Grocery is a drive-up, drive-through service with physical distancing in place to continue serving our community. If you are in need or looking for a charity to do the most good for our community, please consider partnering with us by donating to Santa Clarita Grocery, one of the most efficient charities in the Santa Clarita Valley. A full 99 cents out of every dollar goes directly back to the community. Santa Clarita Grocery operates on a 1% overhead and is sustained through private donations. Santa Clarita Grocery is at 21176 Center Point Parkway in the Oasis Furniture Parking Lot. Please visit our website, SantaClaritaGrocery.org, or our Facebook at Santa Clarita Grocery to make a difference in our awesome town community. 661 425 7575. Be our guest and experience the difference. Santa Clarita, bedbugs are taking over our city. They've invaded our homes, our businesses, and most importantly, our sleep. If you have suspicious bites that appear nightly or have a bug that you need ID'd, your best option is to make one call to All Pro. We offer a 100% guarantee that your bedbug issues will be solved with heat in one treatment. No need to tent or spray your house with chemicals. Heat is all you need. Call 661-298-2200 or text me a bug picture to 661-645-0540. It's time to sleep tight again, SCV. Welcome, folks, to the Backyard Masterpiece Podcast. We have Tom here, a first-time DIYer, talking about the multi-tiered rose garden he planted in his yard. How did you begin this masterpiece? Well, the first thing I did was make the call. The call? Yes, to 811. I knew my project required digging, so I had SoCal Gas come and mark my natural gas lines. Pro tip, take notes, people. Always contact 811 by phone or online two business days before you dig. Yep. Visit SoCalGas.com slash 811 to learn more. No words can describe the power of belonging to a group of close friends or being part of a family. Insight Treatment Center was founded more than 20 years ago to give teenagers a community of friends and family as they overcome issues like depression, anxiety, and trauma. The new Santa Clarita location is a COVID-secure environment where distance and good airflow are a priority. As a leader in providing intensive outpatient treatment to teenagers, Insight Treatment Center in Santa Clarita is here to help. Call 888-295-9995 or go online to insighttreatment.com. I listen to it all day, every day. Hometown. Your hometown station.
So glad you're with us today. It's May 16, and we are in the midst of Mental Health Awareness Month, so let's continue our mental health education together today. Today, we're talking about injuries and trauma and post-traumatic stress and how they're interconnected with and can affect your mental health. If this is something that you'd like to talk to Barbara Wilson about, feel free to call at 661-298-5487. You'll have the privilege of talking to Andrew Delgado today, and he'll, he'll take your call uh, <laughs> and connect you with Barbara. So Barbara just had the first annual Stop the Stigma SCV event this past weekend, and we've been talking about that. We spoke to Andrew Skinner, who suffered a severe spinal injury and went on to create the Triumph Foundation. We've, we've covered some, some interesting topics, one of which I would like to come back to, uh, perhaps, perhaps even devote some more time to next, next episode, but this idea of secondary trauma is really fascinating to me. And, and and it's not that it's so new, right? I mean, you, you talk about um, people who have struggled with addiction. There's There's been plenty of family, you know, and you deal with families as well all the time in your practice. So we know that these things do affect mm -hmm. folks who are not the primary uh, victim or primary you know, patient or what have you. So... I, I love that idea that this is now becoming some you know more and more sort of community oriented and involved and aware. So and that was the whole purpose of this of this event this weekend. So uh, tell tell us more about how that's addressed. I guess this idea of including the family and and secondary trauma and well. It it d kind of depends because we're, you know, we're coming out of. You might hear people talk about silos, that everything's in a silo, like you had physical health down one. Tr I call them tracks because I am old. You, we used to have railroads, and <laughs> there's different we still railroad do. <laughs> tracks. So on one track, you might we had mental health, psychiatric, which I was trained in. I was not trained in a alcohol because that was a different track hmm. um i was not so trained addiction in, was its I own was, track addiction was its own track yes physical medicine was its own track in what is now called intellectual disabilities it used to be called developmentally disabil developmental disabilities um, the regional center folks that was still a different track so they might all be the same person they might not be the same person. So it's only now that we, actually it's due to the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, that promoted the idea of, let's get rid of the silos. We, don't, we have limited resources, so we need to be able to collaborate with each other to pr serve the whole person. A novel idea. Another novel idea is prevention. That if we can provide services to say a person, a young adult like Andrew at 24 years old, let's just say for sake of argument, Andrew had become psychotic. He didn't. But let's just say he did. We now know what anybody could have told him, you know, back in this age when I was growing up working early intervention works it also saves money so if you're looking at it strictly from a, an accounting perspective why wouldn't you want to save money if you look at it from a treatment perspective we always know that prevention is always all there's very few things that that's always true but prevention is always cheaper than the cure well, and and you got you and Andrew talked about this before, but r regardless of of you know why it came about or or who pushed this this type of sort of symbiotic relationship between all the practices, 
it works better, it doesn't it? I mean, isn't that the bottom? Better. Like it you're absolutely saying, absolutely works it, better, and it's less expensive. So, who cares about the expense? Well, theoretically, it's the consumer, but it's really oftentimes it's the insurance providers. Hmm. Uh, they oftentimes dictate what gets approved, what is not approved, what is in network, what is not in network. Uh, so the insurance companies really care about costs. The other people that really care about costs are government. Because if government, if, if I'm government and you come to me and I go, hmm, you know, you have two or three things going on here, so why don't I just start to make some referrals right here, right now, so we can cut through the maze, which is what we do at Mental Health Hookup, actually. Um, then I can t save the taxpayer money. There you go, bingo. <laughs> if, the, <laughs> if the government likes it, then the taxpayer likes it, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. Taxpayer dollars are very valuable, and they can only be spent in certain ways, and they must be accounted for every single penny. I don't mean if the government likes it. I mean if it saves money. It, they always Then the taxpayer likes it. Yes. That's always an argument that yeah. we can never argue for better health care we must always argue in terms of how many taxpayer dollars we will save. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. And and yeah, this this seems like a a much more holistic and effective way. Holistic is and absolutely Andrew the key. And that I just wanted to comment on some of the things that Andrew mentioned that I think are key that I would like key takeaways. One is that he said he went from being Mr. Independent to Mr. Dependent. Hmm. It gives you a real state of mind that he was in at the time. It must have been horrific for him to have, you know, his future so bright, he's got to wear shades to, oh, my God, someone has to help me go to the bathroom. That's huge. It's huge loss. And then he mentioned he wanted if life was even worth living. There's the depression. Mm -hmm. Serious, profound, oh my God, despair. What, what, is, what is there for me to do? All my dreams are shattered. Well, your, well, your identity is... Will I ever have a girlfriend? Will I have children? You know, All of those things come into play. And who do you talk that over with if you're a young man? You certainly don't want to talk it over with a woman. So, you know... There's that issue. And then he talked about how he got support from peers, people who had been through the process and come out the other side. So he got to see, much like we do with college kids, and this is why, you know, side, you know, irrelevant, but I'm very much in favor of four-year schools. Why? Because when kids go to college in their freshman year, they're kind of very lost, and oh my God, I'm so homesick, and the food is terrible, it doesn't taste like mom's, and you know, but by the time they get a, to be a junior, they're like, I've only got one more year, and I'm out of here, and I've got this, and I've got that going. So that's what happens with the peer support, that he was able to see that this is where I am today, but if I am willing to take certain steps then I can get better. I you can may look at someone who's farther down the that's road. That's right. Yeah. You can see a model. Mm -hmm. that, and it, that's very different than a therapist saying, you know, you can get better if you're willing to do certain things. When they see someone that has done that. Living, breathing role models every then day. Then they yeah. get hope. And I see that mm -hmm. with my clients all the time. The importance of peers is astounding. And then the feeling of, you are not alone. Mm. That was one of the things he said. And I, I have exclamation marks. Well, that's a, a perfect place to, to stop today, I would say. It's been wonderful to, to speak to you, Barbara, as always. And it was wonderful to have Andrew Skinner of the Triumph Foundation here. Once again... Mental Health Hookup is a nonprofit and is dedicated to providing clinical support to families affected by serious mental illness in the Santa Clarita Valley and beyond. Whatever mental health services you need, they can provide you or they hook you up with someone who can. They should be your first and last stop for mental health in the Santa Clarita Valley. So if you 
a member of your family or anyone you know is suffering from mental illness, reach out, make an appointment today at mentalhealthhookup.org or by calling 661-799-7994 to speak to a live agent 24 hours a day. As always, we'd like to thank the amazing staff here at KHTS, Andrew Delgado stepping in today for Patty Schwika, Jerry and Carl for their support of this program, and a pleasure to have you here on Mental Health Hookup with Barbara Wilson. You're listening to KHTS. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay optimistic. <laughs>